Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, my name is Martin Ronheimer. As president of the Austrian Institute of Economics and Social Philosophy, which has organized this event, I would like to welcome you very warmly. I thank you all for coming. Even though you perfectly knew that our main speaker, Professor Peter Bötke, could only be present via video for the reasons you have been informed about. I consider your coming despite Professor Bertke's physical absence, so much regretted by all of us, and despite the inconveniences caused by this as a sign of your appreciation of Professor Bertke's outstanding scholarship, which perfectly meets the multiple challenges of our time. So let me extend a warm welcome to Professor Peter Bertke. Pete, you can hear me, see me? Yes, thank you very much. I've lost the, the sound. The subject of today's lecture is Capitalism, Socialism, and Our Future. This is a very timely and crucially important topic. For criticism of capitalism and the market economy has intensified over the last years in the wake of financial crisis, rising wealth inequality, and inflation. Influenced by this criticism, tendentially socialist solutions appear more and more attractive to many, to many people. These are often perceived by a broad public as more social and promising great stability. Peter Bötke will offer us a different perspective, and so I am convinced a lot depends for our future that, is, that it is heard and disseminated. I would also like to welcome very warmly Professor Hans-Jörg Klausinger, the inter internationally known scholar of Friedrich August von Hayek from the Vienna University of Economic, Economics and Business, VU in German, and co-author, together with Bruce Caldwell, of Hayek Alive, the new two-volume biography of Friedrich August von Hayek. The first volume covering the years 1899 to 1950 has been published by the University of Chicago Press in December 20. 2022. Volume 2 is in preparation. Professor Klausinger will engage in a conversation with Peter Bertke following his lecture. We are happy to have you among us and also to celebrate in this way together with you Hayek's birthday, which actually falls on 8th May. Thank you for coming. Before introducing our main speaker, I would like to thank the Federation of Austrian Industries, and in particular, its Secretary General, Christoph Neumayer, for their generous hospitality for this event. Unfortunately, due to another commitment, Mr. Neumayer cannot be with us this evening, as he has done in past years and similar, similar events we have organized in this magnificent venue. Moreover, I wish to express the car caretaker of this house, Mario Potner, and the technical people, especially Walter, Walter Posteiner, hmm? and, uh, and assisted today by Valeska, my sincere thankfulness for their generous support, really generous, magnificent. They have made it possible for this event to take place despite the unforeseen difficulties and have provided us with all the help we needed. Thank you very much. <clears throat> We would also like to thank our cooperation partner, the Diplomatische Akademie Vienna School of International Studies, in particular, Professor Martin Feldkircher, whose contribution has enabled us to reach a very wide circle of interested parties. Unfortunately, Professor Feldkircher is prevented from attending this evening due to other commitments. Before I present our speaker, let me very briefly give you some information about the Austrian Institute of Economics and Social Philosophy. The Austrian Institute, founded in 2014, is a private non-profit organization which makes the case for individual liberty and free markets from an economic, social, and moral perspective, aiming, aiming to bring these into broader public consideration. The Austrian Institute is dedicated to the dissemination of the principles of classical liberalism in the tradition of the Austrian School of Economics, as well as other consistently market-oriented oriented and freedom-based approaches. In particular, 
The Austrian Institute aims at convincing the public, including Christian-minded citizens and church leaders, of the merits of free market and, and, and free market and entrepreneurial solutions to humanity's major social problems. Above all, since 2019, we annually organize our Austrian Academy for students and young professionals, which deals with topics such as market economy, and entrepreneurship, freedom, and justice. Every year, we invite top class speakers. Each participant selected through an application process receives a scholarship that covers all costs of the event. You will find a flyer with the most important information about the Austrian Academy 2023 in the folder you received at the entrance. If you know young people who might be interested in applying, we would be grateful if you could pass on the information. If you yourself are still one of the young people, the best thing to do is to apply yourself. The Austrian Institute is independent in every respect and funded by donations. We are offering today's event free of charge. But thank you for any financial help, payment, slip enclosed with the folder or via our website. So I finally come to Professor Bertke, our main speaker this evening. When introducing an important and well-known speaker, there is always the dilemma of saying too much or too little. I hope I will find the right measure of brevity and due appreciation of the scope and significance of Professor Böttke's work. Peter Böttke is University Professor of Economics and Philosophy at George Mason University, Fairfax, Virginia, near Washington, D.C. Moreover, he is Vice President for Advanced Study, Director of the Friedrich August Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics, as well as the BBNT Professor of the Study of Capitalism at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. He is also non-resident faculty at the Diplomatische Akademie Wien, Vienna School of International Studies, where he had planned to give lectures his months. That was the real reason of his trip to, uh, planned trip to Europe. He could not undertake, unfortunately. Peter Böttke is a specialist in Austrian economics, economic history, institutional analysis, public choice, and social change. Besides his num numerous articles and journals he has authored and co-authored, 11 books, including Living Economics in 2012, F.A. Hayek, Economics, Political Economy, and Social Philosophy, Paul Grave Macmillan, 2018, and his most recent book, you will see it, you have it already on the screen, The Struggle for a Better World, published in 2021 by the Mercati Center at George Mason University. Moreover, Peter Böttke is editor of the Review of Austrian Economics Series, editor of the New Thinking Political Economy book series, and co-editor of the Cambridge Studies in Economics, Choice and Society. And from 2016 to 2018, Professor Böttke served as president of the Mont Pelerin Society. As he explains on his personal website, Peter Böttke's analytical framework is strongly influenced by the paradigm of Austrian economics, as well as other intellectual traditions personif personified by thinkers in the main line, main line of, of economic thought, such as Adam Smith, F.A. Hayek, James M. Buchanan, and Eleanor Ostrom. As a teacher, Peter Böttke is dedicated to cultivating enthusiasm for the economic, economic way of thinking and the importance of economic ideas in future generations and sco of scholars and citizens. He provides new perspectives following, following the tradition of the Austrian school that open access to economic thinking as an approach to the individual human person as an acting being. For Peter Böttke, as for all economists in the Austrian tradition, Economics is not mathematical model thinking, but an analysis of individual human action, and thus has a distinctly humanistic component. Finally, and this may serve as a further proof of his concern for the human person, in 2009, he was inducted as a coach into the local basketball hall of fame in Northern Virginia. So we can say, he is a most typical case of an American university member aiming, aiming at excellence. It is from this vantage ground that he will speak to us this evening. We are excited 
and looking forward to what he will have to share with us. However, before I give the floor to our speaker, allow me the following remarks. You all are cordially invited to the following buffet and further exchange. As in previous years, the buffet is generously sponsored by the Viennese Bank Schellhammer Capital. Many thanks go to chairman of the board, Christian Jauk, represented by Mr. Georg Lemmerer, senior director, and among other responsibilities, head of private banking at Shellhammer Capital. We are very pleased, Mr. Lemmerer, that you are with, with us once more. Thank you very much. <laughs> Finally, we would like to point out that the, this event will be filmed and published as a video on our YouTube channel and our website. The audience will only be visible from behind on the video, so privacy issues should not arise. However, anyone asking a question at the microphone may appear on the video in itself also from behind. If you do not wish to appear on the video, the best is to not ask a question. <laughs> With that, I now finally hand over the floor to our speaker, Professor Peter Pötke. Please, Pete, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, that was a very generous uh, um, introduction, and I greatly appreciate it. I uh, regret uh, to everyone there that I'm not in person, um, but I will try to do my uh, best in, in uh, uh, communicating the basic ideas here without having the normal feedback from an audience. Um, so the title of my talk is Capitalism, Socialism, and Our Future. Um, it is uh, derived from this book of mine called The Struggle for a Better World, uh, which is made up primarily of uh, lectures that I was invited to give at various different learned societies um, since 2000 to 2020. And um, so it's it's not my normal sort of uh, journal research, but it's instead where I had chances to summarize uh, what I thought were the main elements of some of that research trends and bring them together. And then I have a new introduction and conclusion, which try to address some of these bigger um, issues. But before we get started, I, I as, as was mentioned before, today is uh, Professor Hayek's uh, uh, birthday. I have very fond uh, memories of being in Vienna and taking a, a little walking tour of, of Austrian economics that was provided for me. And um, so anyway, Hayek was born in 1899. And um, so it's uh, it's amazing that we are still learning and, and discussing his ideas. But anyway, uh, ha happy birthday to Professor Hayek. All right. Uh, one of the first things that I, I want to sort of get across as we talk about um, this issue of capitalism, socialism, and democracy um, is that what we mean by capitalism is really liberalism. Uh, capitalism, in, in many ways, has a marketing problem because it has a mercantilist problem. Uh, I will explain that a little bit more as we go on. Um, but liberalism, in, in the classic sense of that term, is co-evolved with classical economics. This is laid out in Lionel Robbins's a fantastic book called The Theory of Economic Policy, uh, which I actually finished in 1930s, but wasn't published till the 1950s because of World War II. Um, but in it, what he argues is that the importance of the institutional framework, um, so the property contract and consent from David Hume onwards, this was the idea. Hume in the Treatise of Human Nature lays this out perfect without property, stability of possession, without contract, the keeping of promises, and the transfer of goods and services through consent, that is voluntary exchange, you're not going to end up by having society. Instead, it will become a war of all against all, rather than the idea of the mutually beneficial exchanges that could take place. Uh, the examination of the framework, that is what we do as economists, uh, should be, in fact, the focus of economic analysis. That is, is that we shouldn't be content with treating institutions as fixed and given, but instead must examine where the institutional framework comes from, what is its self-reinforcing uh, uh, forces that allow it to uh, sustain itself or erode itself over time. And that's what we should be studying as economists. And so economics is about exchange and the institutions within which exchange takes place. 
One of the reasons why I start by emphasizing this is because when the development of the socialist critique was precisely a critique of the framework of property, contract, and consent. And the belief that by substituting private property for instead for having collective property or collective ownership of the means of production and production for direct use rather than production for exchange, you would rationalize production and produce a better outcome than is possible under capitalism. But what the problem was with the economists was is that by the time we get to the 1930s and 40s, economics had purged institutions from its economics. And so instead, they strove to have an institutionally antiseptic theory that made them particularly vulnerable to the problems of not recognizing what the difficulties were social, what was with socialism, which is why the work of Mises and Hayek takes on such an importance in this uh, discussion. So what did this liberalism deliver for us? Uh, this liberalism delivered for us a um, tremendous economic growth. Like the big question that we all are asking ourselves is right here. Like what happened right there? What was going on in that regard to lead to this economic growth? And as you can see here in the impact of the industrial revolution on per capita income in England, it's a it's significant spike up, right? This is most of human history. There's very little improvement. And then all of a sudden we get here and then there's this non-scalar amazing improvement that takes place. And what economics is born of is examining precisely that moment. And that's why the key issue is at that moment was the co-evolution of the institutions of a liberal government. But it goes even further. Look at the difference in the countries as we go through time, right? And so liberalism is what produces this enrichment. Statism is what produces the divergence. It has nothing to do with the people or with the geography of where they reside. It has to do with the rules of the social game under which they interact and whether or not they are interacting under liberal rules or whether or not they're acting under non or illiberal rules. And so the, the issue here is, is the, the source of this growth is liberalism. And we have to learn that lesson. That is the key lesson that we must learn. Um, otherwise, we'll be doomed to repeat. Uh, the errors. What does this liberalism also deliver? Um, in 2015 is the first time that less than 10% of the world's population was living in extreme poverty. When I was a, a student learning economics for the first time, which would have been right around here, okay, that it was closer to 40% of the world's population was living in extreme poverty. If I go back further over here, we're in 90% of the world's population is living in extreme poverty. So just a look at that amazing deliverance of the bottom to be lifted up, to escape the great escape from extreme poverty, to escape the Malthusian trap. That is an amazing uh, 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 development. Uh, Deirdre McCloskey in, in her work says as follows, sums it up, uh, liberal rhetoric explains many of the good features of the modern world compared with earlier illiberal regimes. The economic success of the modern world, its splendid arts, its sciences, its kindness, its toleration, its inclusiveness, its cosmopolitanism, and especially its massive liberation of more and more people from the violent hierarchies, ancient and modern, that's due to liberalism. That is, that is uh, you know, the byproduct of a liberal system. But People have always asked the social question, you know, which is what do you do with poverty, ignorance, disease, poor living conditions, and unemployment? Uh, this is an example from the Beverage Report, uh, which is uh, um, as uh, Hans George will be able to uh, to uh, talk about. You know, when we did this, this was a very big issue with regard to Hayek in addressing this issue of beverage and, and, and sort of this critique of, of, of liberal order and how it is that the liberal system actually would, in fact, address those issues. Um, so as, as Father Ryan uh, you know, put it before, unleashing the entrepreneurial solutions to these social ills, that, that's going to be one of the, the main messages, I think, that comes out of this. But, you know, it's not the case that economists were blind to these social ills. And we're not blind today. So that was the beverage report. And now this is the Occupy Wall Street 
uh, kind of criticisms, right? We have inequality. This is it's very U.S. centric. My knowledge that I'm going to be giving, but I'm pretty sure it applies across the board in in from my travels in in the U.K. and in in uh, in Europe. Um, so what do we complain about today? We complain about inequality, the social mobility between the economic quintiles, instability due to the financial crisis, but also geopolitical instability due to war and, and, and whatnot, and also injustice, that is the police brutality and other kinds of issues. Um, if you're watching the news right now, we're kind of in a, in a new uh, round of that in New York City because of an unfortunate uh, event that happened on the subways just in the last uh, you know week. Um, and so there's protests and, and, and whatnot trying to address these issues. We're trying to grapple with these issues. And economists are not blind to these issues. Economists have answers to these issues. Um, and, and, but, it, but the critics often think that economics are blind to it. But this is what Adam Smith said, right? Is that, you know, don't read the whole quote, but just the, the highlighted part, no society can surely be flourishing and happy of which the far greater part of the members are poor and miserable. That's not in the theory of moral sentiments, that's in the wealth of nations, all right? So Smith understood, you know, what it is that we have to grapple with as economists. And so, but the answer for economists was always to recognize the trade-offs that are embedded. We want to do the most effective way to minimize human suffering and maximize human flourishing, but against constraints. The choices are always against the constraints of nature. Uh, that is scarcity and, and trade-offs that we face, coordinating distant and disparate individuals. That's productive specialization, assuring cooperation among strangers. Uh, as, as Smith put it, scarce in our lifetime, but we have the opportunity to make a few close personal friends, but yet we rely on the great multitude for our daily survival. So it's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the baker, and the brewer. We expect our dinner, but with regard to their self-interest, that's assuring the cooperation among multitudes of strangers, mutually beneficial exchange, and that the, the benefits of all of this, the conscious recognition of the trade-offs and, and prudent uh, balancing of trade-offs, the pursuit of productive specialization, the realization of mutually beneficial exchange. The benefit of that is that it increases the welfare of the least advantaged in society. So we get peace and prosperity. Again, it's important to stress that the system, that systematic economic science was a critique of the privileged system of mercantilism. And the birth of economic liberalism is in the same vein as that of political liberalism. The eradication of arbitrary obstacles created by the powerful and the privileged to enable the rise of commercial society to lift humanity from misery of poverty and the subjugation of unchecked authority. This is Smith's liberal plan for liberty, equality, and justice. And this is what my, you know, like Hayek, uh, I believe that right now, like, you know, if you, if you look at the first words in the Constitution of Liberty, Hayek demands his readers that it's time for the liberal doctrine to be re-examined, restructured. And I think that we face a similar time today, is that we are in a process of there, we have to meet the challenges of the 21st century, we have to speak uh, to those things, and we have to address the questions. What we should have learned, the lesson from 1989 and onwards, is that we should have learned that socialism is not the answer to our social ills. This balancing that the economists and the liberal has, economic liberals have, provides the solution, not socialism. Socialism cannot provide the answer to our social ills because it does not and cannot work. And the reason why it cannot and, 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 and does not work is because of the, uh, the issues that Mises and Hayek identified uh, more than any other um, uh, scholars in the 20th century. So the first one is the problem of economic calculation. This is Mises' critical insight about the pricing process and monetary calculation and how that affects rationalization of production. Capitalism achieves every day what socialism cannot achieve. And that is, is that capitalism, through the issue of property prices and profit and loss, is able to sort from the array of technologically feasible projects those that are economically viable. What markets do is they produce more with less, not less with more. 
It doesn't matter what the ultimate goal is in terms of people's desire to achieve non-material goods or whatever. They have to pursue those things in a way where they can get more of that for less inputs rather than less of it for more inputs. That would be the opposite of, of rational production. The second thing is that the organizational form of planning, of trying to substitute for a private property system, a communal property system or a state-owned property system, and the idea of production for direct use rather than production for profit gives us an organizational logic which centralizes control in, in certain hands. And that concentration of power ends up by creating various different special interest groups and it creates the idea of the doctrine that Hayek laid out in The Road to Serfdom. The Road to Serfdom is a tragic tale. It's not that bad people do bad things. It's that people with high aspirations end up by pursuing a set of policies which produce a nightmare to the, from their own point of view. And that's the, the issue having to do with the, the, the sort of um, inherent logic of the idea of planning. The one last thing I'll say to that is Hayek is not making a slippery slope in the deterministic way. It's not that you take one step towards socialism and you necessarily collapse to the gulag. It's that if you continue to pursue socialism, the logical outcome will be that. But at each node, you're capable of, in fact, going back to the more liberal order. And so that, that if you take Hayek's warning seriously, you end up by not getting the Hayekian result because you back off of the extreme centralization aspects of things. That doesn't get rid of the dysfunctions that interventionism, uh, you know, produces, but it does. It does prevent us from collapsing into a totalitarian nightmare. Twentieth century, unfortunately, was filled with totalitarian nightmares, and we should never forget that lesson. But we didn't, right? Right now, as this is this is in America. I think uh, I've seen data on the UK, which shows a similar trend. I'm involved with a project at the Fraser Institute in Canada called Realities of Socialism. I recommend all of you to go to their website. It's the opposite of their Economic Freedom Index. They now have a new program called Realities of Socialism, and I'll have a monograph on the history of Poland's uh, efforts to reform itself and, and whatnot coming out uh, at the end of this month. Um, but, uh, you know, if you look at that, you'll see in Canada, there's also a rise of, uh, you know, uh, socialism and so socialist um, acceptance among, especially among the youth. And so here's, you know, what we see here in terms of the party membership of the Democratic Socialists of America. Um, you have here different positive attitudes that people have about socialism versus capitalism. And again, you're dealing with structural uh, inequalities financial instability, um, injustice, a political, legal, and social injustice. Just again, to highlight some of these things, the instability we just witnessed in terms of these banking uh, you know, failures that we've had in the United States just recently. Um, you know, in terms of the inequality, one of the things that's one of the big projects that's going on at the moment is Raj Chetty's uh, you know, opportunity index. And what's happened in the United States is the movement between the quintiles has in fact slowed, right, um, over time. Now, the question is why? Economists always have to answer why questions. Uh, that's where economic theory comes in. And one of the arguments that economists would give, let's say like an economist like Casey Mulligan, who's uh, wrote a fantastic book called the, Re uh, the Redistribution Recession to describe, you know, the difficulties of the 2008 to 2010 period, um, what we've done is we've actually gummed up labor markets, which have in fact prevented the ability of individuals to move between the quintiles. We've made it more difficult to hire people and, 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 and whatnot over time rather than less. And this is a, a very important part that gets missed um, in a lot of explanations about why we're having this gumming up of our, of our, um, you know, our labor markets. So the question, the main point that I want to get across to you is that the answer to the dysfunctions that we see in the world is not more dysfunctions. One of the issues in my book, The Struggle for a Better World, and the term struggle is meant to have two meanings in that title. The first meaning is the scholarly struggle, 
which is that as scholars, we struggle to make sense of the world around us. And we continue to refine our theories and test them against uh, the empirical reality and then refine again and think again and, and go back to the drawing board. And we spend a life of a lifetime, hopefully being a lifelong learner, not having the same answers we had at 18 when we're 58. And instead, just continuing to learn and, 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 and adapt and adjust as we see the world and we get new information. So that's, that's a struggle. It's, it's, a, it's a joyful struggle, the pleasure of finding things out, but it, it's not an easy task to find things out. On the other hand, the second part of his struggle is struggle as citizens to actually live in a better world. Um, and that idea comes from, you know, the notion that, you know, we're trying to heal a broken world. And how as citizens do we act in the face of this broken world to try to, 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 to heal it? And that, I think, is also a struggle uh, that we face. And so it means both of those in the book. So the question is, is in struggling both as an economist and as a citizen, who's going to be the adult in the room? That's the big question. All right. So we have theory and we have history. And we have to actually be very honest and forthright in the way that we address these issues um, a, a, in the world. And so what are the three things that I'll mention here that need addressing, which in fact are not being discussed in a rational way in the U.S.? And I imagine they're not being discussed elsewhere as effectively either. The first thing is monetary mischief. So if we look at the balance sheet of our central banks, of the Fed in the U U.S. case, one of the things that's happened is we, in order to, to, to fight, let's say, the, you know, the downturns in the early part of the, of the 2000s, right? Greenspan did what? He did what they called a Greenspan put. Every single time that there was a downturn in the economy, he fl uh, flooded the economy with liquidity. And as a result, we ended up by not having the downturn. But what he did was he just continued to expand uh, you know, what's going on with the monetary system. And that happened again with the way Bernanke fought, uh, you know, the, the the financial crisis in 2008. And again, the way that we paid for COVID was in fact precisely this. There's a, a really good paper by Tom Sargent that I recommend people that are clued into economics to look at. And what he does is he compares the way that the U.S. financed World War I, World War II, and then COVID. Um, and 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 the and the comparison and difference of those things. What we did was we basically you know provided a tremendous amount of liquidity into the economy, and we haven't figured out what the end game strategy of the Fed is. That's what's been going on over the last year with these raising of the interest rates and all the rest of this stuff. The other thing that goes on is that we have engaged since World War II in promissory politics. That is a concept of called intergenerational accounting which is that how much have we promised the future generations and how about our ability to pay for those future obligations that the government has made? And if you look at that, it's a thing called the fiscal gap. And our fiscal gap prior to COVID was over $211 trillion, which would require an amazing cut in government expenditures and, a, and an amazing increase in taxation to be able to, to uh, you know, even come close to balancing that out. So one of the things that you either need is a tremendous increase in your population or a tremendous exponential growth in your economy as the only way in which you can get out of this trap. Otherwise, you're dealing with this serious problem of, of fiscal irresponsibility. But we have to have that conversation. And as you know, if you're, uh, uh, you know, following U.S., uh, policy right now we're in midst of you know a um, you know a whole thing with the budget and and the debt ceiling and the discussions of that and you know so we're not having the kind of conversation that you would need to have to address the question of fiscal irresponsibility and then the final thing is the pathology of privilege that is the structural distortions in the U.S. system, uh, precisely because we become a more rent-seeking society rather than a market society. This is what I mean by capitalism having a marketing problem because it has a mercantilist problem. Most people that are casual observers blame a lot of the idea of the moneyed interest that balance, get the government to balance the scales in their favor at the expense of others as a consequence of capitalism. 
But that's really a consequence of a fact of the state involvement in capitalism, which is the mercantilist system. And so it's exactly what Adam Smith argued against rather than the, the, the system that Adam Smith argued for, which is a more trade and generality norm. Hayek devoted a lot of energy, um, I hope we'll talk about this, to the idea of how can I have a set of policies that are in fact meet a generality norm. So they don't benefit some parties at the expense of others. The natural tendency in politics is to concentrate benefits on well-organized, well-informed interest groups and disperse the costs on the unorganized and ill-informed mass of voters. That is concentrated benefit dispersed costs. If you have a high generality norm, that concentration of benefits dispersing of costs can't take place. And so this is one of the reasons why Hayek is trying to wrestle with the idea of political football. And we haven't had serious conversation about what kind of restrictions at the level of rules that would be able for us to condemn the pathology of privilege and, in fact, develop rules which will cut that out of our social system. Uh, let's see. All right. And most importantly, this is what I said, you know, meant before, is the way that we have that adult conversation is economic science. Because economic science provides the logical anchor in our examination of the institutional compatibility, right? We have to discuss the institutional compatibility, incentive compatibility, to get the reforms, you know, what reforms we have have to be incentive compatible and our effort to get those reforms instituted have to be incentive compatible. If they're not, they're not going to go anywhere. And so we have to, and economics is the, is the tool that we use to have that conversation. So in our reconstructed liberalism, this is a diagram from my good friend, uh, Emily Chamley Wright, who is the president of the Institute for Humane Studies. And she refers to the, the issue that's going on in liberalism today as the four corners of liberalism. So liberalism um, has these tensions between these different elements, political liberalism, economic liberalism, right, cultural liberalism, and then scientific, uh, you know, liberalism, the science in a free society. And, and how do we have these different tensions at, at, at work here? And what she argues is that the strength of the liberal order is from the interaction of these tensions, just like a suspension bridge has the tensions that allow that suspension bridge to be robust uh, in, 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 in dealing with a lot of traffic. And I think that this is the same way we have to think about the liberal project. The liberal project is an emancipatory project. It lifts the poorest in society up from the misery of poverty, okay? By doing what? By unleashing the entrepreneurial spirit. Um, as Matt Ridley points out in his book, How Innovation Works, innovation is the child of freedom, but the parent of prosperity. Remember that phrase, the child of freedom, but the parent of prosperity. This is what was referred to earlier as this unleashing of entrepreneurial solutions to these social problems that we have. And yet we're going to rely on these individuals who are alert and clever and creative to be able to solve those problems uh, by coming up with new ways. But what's the challenge that we face today? So I'm going to do a little bit of a, of a time hop here. This is the concept of tacit presuppositions of political economy. This is the head quote uh, that I use in my book. It's from Hayek's Law, Legislation, and Liberty. This is street art from the, uh, the uh, Occupy Wall Street movement, it says, help, this economy is killing us. All right. And that's the sort of tacit presupposition that emerged in the 21st century. But let me do a little time hop and go back to me. I was born in 1960. So I'm 63 years old. I went to college as a college freshman um, in the late 70s. I started studying economics in 1979. Why was economics so, so, especially free market economics, why did it resonate with me as a student? Well, because when I was growing up in, in, in New Jersey, in, in a sort of work, working class town of New Jersey, uh, you know, older brothers were going off to fight in Vietnam. All right. Uh, you know, not everyone went to college in my town, so they didn't get the college deferment. All right. And so, you know, as soon as I can remember in the, as a, as a, 
preteen, I was seeing, you know, the problems with the Vietnam War going on. Um, and then it just, you know, exacerbated uh, during the, the early 70s. Um, and so you get also then the scandals at the White House, which associated with, uh, you know, Spiro Agnew, people forget this, but the vice president of the United States um, had to resign in a scandal. And then you have the Watergate scandal with, with Nixon, um, and then he's forced to resign. Um, at the same time, in the mid-1970s, you start right when I'm learning to drive, you, you, see, you, you suffer from gas lines, long lines of queuing and, and whatnot, because there's a gas shortage in the United States. Jimmy Carter, president of the United States, because we had a natural gas shortage in the winter, when I was like a senior in high school, he actually came on TV with a cardigan sweater and told us all that he was going to unleash the Boy Scouts to make sure that no one had their thermostat above 58 degrees because of the, uh, of the shortage that was faced. All right. And so, and then we had the stagflation, um, you know, of, of the 1970s, which is for the first time since then, we are faced with that today in our economy. The levels of inflation that we are dealing with in the US at the moment, highest levels since, in fact, these 1970s. So, my, in my head, my learned experience, my, my world around me, I would never look to politics as the solution to the social ills. All right. That wouldn't be the case. In fact, politics was the cause of the social ills. Uh, they were corrupt. Uh, they were incompetent um, and, and whatnot. So you, you didn't actually think of the government romantically. So therefore, when people start talking to me about the power of economic reasoning, it made perfect sense to me to unleash the incentives that individuals have the, to focus on the cleverness and creativity of economic actors. Um, and, and whatnot. That was my tacit presuppositions. So when my professor came along, his name is Hans Senholtz, and introduced me to free market ideas, it was like opening up a screen door that was already unlocked. But how about kids today? Like when we walk into a classroom today and try to talk to the youth, what's their tacit presuppositions? Well, remember that they were born after communism was even reforming. They have no idea about the lived experience of communism. To them, communism might as well be a Charlie Chaplin film. It's that oh, that much in the past. It's that black and white, you know, uh, uh, no talky movie, right? It's just the silent movies or whatever. And so it's it's remote from their concerns. Uh, in fact, 9-11 didn't even really resonate with a freshman today. All right. They, they were they were not born with 9-11, but they dealt with the consequences of 9-11, which is that the permanent war economy, which we've experienced in the United States since 9-11, uh, which includes also, you know, the surveillance state and all kinds of other things that we we agreed to in our uh, striving for security. We had when they were uh, just in their, um, you know, early, uh, like late uh, you know, uh, not teens, but like, you know, when they were 10, 11, 12, uh, that's when they experienced the global financial crisis. And then while they were in high school, they had to deal with COVID-19, which went from 2020 until we haven't even, uh, it's next week, or actually three days from now, will be the first time that we declare that the emergency is over. May 11th is when the emergency for COVID uh, in the United States will, will be declared over. And they also have been constant drumbeats about the concerns with climate change. So a, co a college freshman today, when they step into an economics class, it's like a steel door, double bolted, locked shut. And so it's very difficult for them to see how it is that capitalism can be an answer to the social ills, how entrepreneurship can be an answer to social ills, because all they've ever learned was that entrepreneurship is responsible for the instability and injustice and whatnot in the world that they live in today. And so this is why the task of being an economic communicator is even more important today than it's been since any time since before like 1960. And so this is gonna be my last slide. Uh, and so then we'll have you know a conversation and whatnot um, is that uh, you know these, you have to meet students where they are. Um, I have a book called The Four Pillars of Economic Understanding. This is based on that. I try to communicate to students that economics is a tool for the curious 
and it provides intellectual discipline for the compassionate. And the four pillars of economics are, are represented by the notions of truth in the light of economics. That is the power of economic reasoning when we recognize the primordial reality of, of scarcity and the necessity of trade-offs. Let me put this very simple so that it relates to the debate on calculation and whatnot. Because we live in a world of scarcity, we must, in fact, negotiate trade-offs. In a commercial society, we're given aid to the human mind to negotiate those trade-offs by property, prices, and profit and loss. Property incentivizes us, prices guide us, profits lure us, losses discipline us. Without that guide of property prices and profit and loss, our economic compass is lost. And we'll be unable to be able to make those kind of rational economic decisions sorting between the array of technologically feasible projects, those which in fact are economically viable. So first thing, first lesson of economics is you have to teach people about scarcity and trade-offs. As Thomas Sowell likes to say, the first lesson of economics is that we live in a world of scarcity. The first rule of politics, deny scarcity. And we can't let the denying of the scarcity actually take place. The second thing about economics, um, and this is one of the areas where Hayek was extremely talented at doing, which is the awe and beauty of economics. That is the complex coordination of the invisible hand, the spontaneous order of the market. And we need to communicate an appreciation of that interconnectedness that follows from the ability of property prices and profit and loss to do their job of guiding and controlling and, and disciplining economic actors so that we can have this tremendous matrix, a complex matrix of interconnectedness throughout the world to be able to generate this outcome. And so we have to actually communicate the beauty of economics to our students so they appreciate that. Third thing is hope. And that hope relies on those graphs that I showed you earlier about the great fact of human history and the improvement that takes place for the least advantage in society by changes in the rules of social interaction that enable individuals to pursue productive specialization and realize peaceful social cooperation through exchange. By unleashing the entrepreneurial spirit in society, we end up by lifting up, and that's great hope. We, we deliver people from misery. That's the idea of the first time in human history falling behind, below 10% of the world in, in extreme poverty. And then finally, Economics is about compassion, right? It is not about improving the life of the wealthiest in society or the most privileged in society. It is true that economic growth will, in fact, improve the life condition of the wealthiest in society, but it improves the life conditions of the least advantaged in society at a faster rate than it improves the lives of the rich in society. All you have to do is think about the history of this little device. All right, this little device, if you go back in history, all right, in the 1980s, the only people that could have this device were billionaires. In fact, that's one of the storylines on, on Dallas, right, is that Victoria Principal's character, Bobby Ewing's wife's on Dallas, you know, dies in the story because she's talking on her cell phone in her fancy car, all right? But now every student that I teach has a cell phone. Right. The, 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 and it's because of this amazing. In fact, this computing power on this Apple phone is greater than the computing power that was on the Apollo spaceships that went to the moon. So it's an amazing advance. That's what happens with the development of economic uh, progress is that you end up by having a greater widespread uh, you know, distribution of these luxury goods of one generation become normal goods in the next generation. Joseph Schumpeter in, in uh, his work referred to this with regard to silk stockings, that silk stockings in one generation was only available to princes, uh, right? And then, uh, you know, prin princesses. And then in a next generation, it was available to the factory workers. Just think about what all that entails. And that's, if we teach economics as a tool for the curious and as an intellectual discipline for the compassionate, and we teach it in terms of these four pillars, I am very convinced that we'll be able to start to actually meet students where they are, to address the concerns that they have about inequality, about instability, and about in injustice, and have them understand the power of the liberal order 
as opposed to turning to government for more and more solutions to their social ills. And we have to do that at this particular moment because we are in a crisis mode of a tipping point where if we don't address that, the socialist alternative will turn from being what people consider to be desirable to then implementable. And then we will have to relive the mistakes of the 20th century. Okay, I am going to stop sharing and open it up for questions. Thank you very much, Pete, for this, for this talk, for this lecture, which for me was a real highlight of combination of economic thinking and social philosophy in the best tradition of the great classic economics. Um, let me add, add a second point. When reading your last book, I prepared that. Mm -hmm. uh, one of your core statements particularly struck me. I read, I quote from your book, which force will ultimately determine our future path will be a function of ideas. Economic logic and reality are not subject to popular vote any more than the law of gravity or the physical laws governing the flow of water in a river. Reality is simply, simply is not optional. That's the quotation. As a matter of fact, reality is not optional. And it is precisely the, econom the economist's ta task to point out the effective constraints of reality that any attempt to make people better off must consider. For this to happen, having the right ideas derived from clear economic thinking is crucial. What seems intuitively right is not often economically and therefore socially harmful. This is another most important lesson we have learned from your presentation today. Thank you very much for this and for all further insights, which I do not need to comment on now, because uh, now we will go on with our event. And uh, let me instead now introduce Austrian Institute staff member and Austrian Academy manager, Lisa Marie Muller. Uh, she's a specialist in controlling financial officer in an NGO and a master student of international business administration in Vienna and in the process of finishing her master th thesis. Lisa will introduce Professor Hans-Jörg Klausinger and moderate the following conversation between him and Peter Böttke, holding the scepter until the end of the event. Please, Lisa and Professor Klausinger, thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Peter, again. So good evening also from my side. I have the pleasure to introduce you very shortly to Professor Klausinger. Some of you might argue that there's no need for an introduction because he's well known here. Anyway, so I will just give a few words about him. So he's Professor Emeritus of the Vienna University of Economics and his research focus is on the history of the economic theories in the 20th century, especially the Austrian School of Economics. In the recent years, he mainly worked um, on the works of Friedrich August of ha von Hayek. Among many other things, um, he edited two volumes, each of the English and of the German language, um, of collected works of Hayek, which focus on the theories of money and on the business cycle. Besides that, he is also, together with Bruce Caldwell, author of Hayek, A Life, uh, this is a biography which covers 50 years of Hayek's life, and um, some scholars already said that it's a major scholarly achievement. The first volume was published recently, as we heard before, in December 2022, so you can already read that one. And we're looking forward to the second volume, which is under preparation. Um, the Economist even rated the book um, among the best books of 2022. It covers Hayek's first five decades. So as we all know, it starts in Vienna 
And then it shows his career and his relationships in London and Cambridge. And also some family disputes. And it also shows the definite accounts on creation of the road to serfdom and the founding of the more parallel society. So those are all words from my side. Now I would like to invite you to engage into a discussion with Professor Betke. Afterwards, you will have the chance to ask some questions as well. So I, I'm very grateful for this invitation and <clears throat> also for the opportunity to listen to the lecture of, uh, of Pete, which was, as always, wide-ranging and very enthusiastic. And this is just in a time when such enthusiasm appears to be more necessary than ever. Uh, I'd like to pick out two aspects and then uh, follow this one query. In, in your lecture, you argue first that a genuine, genuine liberal order, economic, political, social, that is a kind of uh, liberal utopia, a kind of liberal utopia is feasible, which if realized would provide us with uh, efficient solutions to our problems. In contrast, the promises of socialist, or let's say, uh, statist solutions cannot be fulfilled and will in the end prove as recipes for disaster. Second, you identify a lot of flaws in the current system, inequality, monetary and financial disorder, the climate crisis. Uh, but these are not, as many would argue, the evil consequences of neoliberalism, but to the contrary, result from policies that have diverged too far from the liberal model. Now, if we, if we take this diagnosis for granted, the, the simple but difficult to answer question is, uh, how can we come from there to, how can we come from here to there? From the current uh, malaise to the liberal utopia. And I think, uh, if we want to, to, to answer these questions, we have to proceed, or the, we have to, to uh, answer at least two, uh, two or three questions or the proceed at two or three stages. The first stage is what, what we have discussed here, that we must identify the proper response to a problem as it would be effective in a liberal order close to this utopia. Uh, perhaps uh, a legal framework valid for one country in isolation or a legal framework uh, valid for the, for the world as a whole. Uh, at, the at the second stage, we must uh, we must ask how we can bring about such a liberal solution. In one of your papers, you referred to this as the as the as the paradox of government. The paradox of government is that if the goal of a liberal order is to constrain the power of government, because we fear that the policymakers in government will act in their own self-interest rather than for the common good. How can these policymakers be embraced, uh, be induced to embrace a liberal solution that would just indeed limit their power? And at the third stage, granted that a proper solution has been found or implemented for a single country, how can we deal with what could be called the, the global collective action problem? It doesn't suffice uh, to have good solutions or to have good policies, good liberal policies in one country if they are spillover effects from the rest of the world. And if one country unilaterally pursues a good policy and other countries pursue what we may term a bad policy, then the benefits from what the good country does may accrue to the bad countries. And the harm that the bad countries create may also affect the good country. So how can we, in, in such a constellation, deal with this collective action problem? I think all these stages point that there's a, that there's a tension between, uh, even also from, from the liberal point of view, between the theoretically optimal and the politically feasible. And the question is, which I now want to, to put to Pete, is, uh, can 
the adherents to the liberal case content themselves with, uh, this, with a discourse which is concentrated only to the first stage of the problem. Uh, should we also address the problem of the paradox of government? Should we also the, address the, the, this general uh, collective action problem? Uh, what would a liberal's response be to all the, the, the current problems that we envisage now, to the problem of, of money and inflation or the problem of climate crisis? Uh, is it sufficient to point out that all this would not have happened if we had lived in the liberal utopia all the time? And I want to, to finish my first, uh, my first question with two uh, uh, Well, with, with, with two passages, no, with, with, with two arguments from, from Hayek in this regard. I think that Hayek was quite optimistic. Uh, he agreed with his rival Keynes that, on the famous quotation from Keynes, that the world is ruled by little else but by the ideas of past economists and philosophers. And I, I came about uh, a session that Hayek organized for the Montpellier Society in the 1950s which was titled The Liberal Theory of Public Opinion. And he summarized, he summarized it quite briefly. The liberal theory of public opinion is that the truth will win. And that is that liberalism will triumph. But this is a, a view which uh, uh, needs, I think, a lot of patience for the observers. So I would like to have your response to this idea, uh, musings. Um, so, uh, I mean, as is expected, just amazing questions. Thank you very much. Um, and I'll start, you know, just with the end, uh, and come back to it, I think, because, um, as you know, Hayek thought that even in getting the fatal conceit, he was trying to organize a grand debate, right? That would somehow, you know, finally have the leading liberals and the leading socialists hash it out for the whole world to see in some sense. And so he definitely believed in the long run. He believed in the power of ideas. And, um, and he believed in this, in this uh, liberal utopia as a, um, as a guide, a guide, uh, you know, post. So a large part of my first answer to your question is that I'm, I'm following in the line of intellectuals and socialism, as well as in a little monograph that W.H. Hutt wrote called Politically Impossible? Question mark. And the point is, is that, that we economists, if we try to water down our discussions for political feasibility, they're going to be watered down even further by the politicians who then try to work with them. And so they'll end up by being unrecognizable to us, um, uh, you know, down the road. So what we need to do is articulate a version of what the liberal order would look like. Um, to give you an example, during the COVID crisis, um, I had the opportunity to, to write some articles and I tried to, I wrote an article for Georgetown Law Review, which was trying to take Mill's harm principle right? So you take Mill's harm principle, and then you run to see how you would deal with a, um, a, a, big, a big problem like the COVID disease, right? And, and, and ways that you would approach that, which would be different than having a non-liberal response. So to a large extent, what the world's governments did was they suspended liberalism in order for the idea that they could save liberalism, right? That at least the Western democracies at some level were saying that. Um, but it erodes the idea of the liberal order. But what if we just kept ourselves in, 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 in a liberal order response? Can we, in fact, handle such a significant, you know, uh, uh, externality as, as was existing here? And I think this is, if I can, you know, again, you know, I, I, it's weird for me because I don't have the feedback from the audience here. But if I was talking to other economists, um, I would say that, look, economics, you know, people that have responded to the body of thought, which is called market failure theory, free market people, they've responded in th one of three ways. So the first way is kind of like, you know, would be called conceptual clarity. 
And it's a response which tries to excuse away the failure that people are identifying because, you know, you didn't identify the relevant market. You define the market too narrow. If you define the market broad enough, then nothing's a monopolist. If you define it too narrow, everything's a monopolist. So let's define the market differently than the way you did that. And so that's the first response, which is kind of the conceptual clarity. It's most identified with the Chicago school um, and the way that they kind of, you know, the, the world is um, efficient, you know, whatever it is, is efficient and, and, and whatnot. Um, the second one is a more Kosian response, which is that the reason why we have these dysfunctions is because the institutional arrangements are dysfunctional. We haven't clarified the property rights. We're not enforcing them strong enough. So what we need to do is rearrange the property rights and we'll end up by getting Pareto improvements through doing that. And then the third one is the entrepreneurial response. Today's inefficiency is tomorrow's profit opportunity for the person that recognizes and acts on it. And so the question that I would ask in trying to think through is how can we move from the conceptual clarity point, which I think is more or less like a Jedi mind trick, you know, there is no market failure, right? And, and that's not an acceptable intellectual answer to the idea of the Kosian and the Hayekian answer, which is about institutional, you know, rearrangements or you know, Kersnerian alertness to opportunities to change. And so this is where the, the liberal with inside of the liberal framework tries to address the social ills that exist in the world that we have today. Now, let me just respond back to you about a reality check, which is that um, we live in an intellectual world that tells us that the evils of the contemporary world are due to neoliberalism. And so this is a major part of having to try to get the history right and the theory right about what neoliberalism is, what it isn't, and, you know, what, what was the actual, you know, story there. That much said, you're still stuck with the from here to now and here to there problem, right? Which is, you know, kind of <clears throat> what you raised about transitions. How do I go from the current sort of system, which isn't working, to fixing it? And I think there's the first thing is one way to think about it is maybe um, rather than fight the political interest groups, uh, maybe what we do is think about examples like Uber, uh, you know, an Uber vacation, a variety of things. So what happened with Uber? Uber didn't in the United States, for example, there's taxi cab medallions. Or in, in London, there was the, the, black, the black cabs, right? And they were highly regulated and, and protected. So you could try to defeat them by having a political battle. Or what you could do is just allow technology to erode their market share and, dis and dissipate their rents, right? And so this is what's happening with this kind of lowering of transaction costs economy. Um, I think that we should look at that. Now, let me just say one, two last things, and then I'll, then I'll, we'll go back to talking. Uh, from, I want to hear back from you. But um, the, the one which you raise is a very important question, which is how about if I pick unilaterally liberalism, but my neighbors are illiberal? What happens to me? Well, in the data, this is not a theoretical answer. It's an empirical question. But in the data that we see, there's a thing called capitalist contagion. Um, this is, uh, or a liberal contagion. So uh, one of the papers in this is by uh, my colleague, Pete Leeson and Russ Sobel. It's in the American, politi uh, the American Political Science Journal um, or the journal of uh, AJPS, American Journal of Political Science. And it, what it, they call it is contagious capitalism, which is that if you have a country here and it improves its economic freedom index, what does that do to the country that's adjacent to it? Well, it turns out the country adjacent to it becomes more free too. And so you can have this contagion and it can also go the other way, right? So you can have it go the other way and, and, and do that. So I think that we need to think about ways in which we can unleash the liberal contagion um, uh, in, in these areas. And then the last thing I would say is, this is why I think Buchanan is a very, James Buchanan is a very good complement to Hayek. In many ways, as you know, they contrast with each other because one is about evolution of institutions. The other one is about construction of institutions. 
All right. Um, but in another way, they actually are on the same page in, in many ways. So you can think about Buchanan's discussion of from the here and now as actually picking up, you know, where it is in the evolutionary path that we are. And then within the feasible set, designing rules that will end up by giving us Pareto improvements. And I think this is where we have to think seriously about the kind of questions that you, uh, you know, were talking about. Yes, you, you, you spoke about the, the, the opposition between uh, evolution and design and between Hayek and Buchanan. But I think in, in, the, in the evolution of Hayek's works, he also had uh, a period, which is just covered in, in, in our book, uh, where he spoke, where he, he emphasized the importance of the legal framework within uh, the spontaneous order can only evolve. And I, I sometimes make a joke in, in, in uh, contrasting the, the Hayek of the 1950s with the late Hayek, with the late Hayek because in the 1950s, Hayek explicitly uh, referred to the legal framework as intelligently designed, which is just the opposite of his, his later view, where he trusted to some kind of uh, evolutionary process. And I think, I, I, I don't want to adjudicate which, which of the both Hayek's is, is more right and is, is, is more wrong. But I think in, in, present, in, in, in the present day uh, system, there's a lot of legal frameworks which, if we like it or not, uh, decide. Some of them, uh, some of them may be not so very intelligently designed, but they are designed. So, uh, would you also identify this as the task of the economist and in particular of the liberal economist to contribute something to this discussion of an intelligent design of legal frameworks? I think at the beginning, when when Hayek uh, uh, founded the Mont Pelerin Society. Uh, his idea was that all these people which, which, which gathered in the society uh, represented uh, various shades of liberalism. And all, all those could cooperate in, 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 in finding a, what he called a positive program for liberalism, namely to contribute to the, the discussion how sh should such a a framework which is conducive to a liberal system. How should should this uh, uh, be not? I don't want to say constructed, but how should it be? The, how should it be designed? And I think this would be one of, of the of the contributions from from liberal economists, even if we confine our our discourse to the to the first stage of the let's say purely theoretical and not to the problems of practical possibility of feasibility. So I, I think that the distinction is very important to understand between the rule of law and law of rules. And so what we have in the world today is not necessarily the rule of law, but instead a lot of, uh, you know, rules <laughs> that are, uh, that are, that are constantly being, you know, done. So rule, uh, you know, rule or law by rules are just constantly evolving. So we would look at regulations, legislation, things like that, as opposed to the rule of law, which is more the generality norm. And I think that you're right that Hayek is thinking of, uh, you know, enlist, en enlisting uh, the brain trust of all of these shades of liberalism. You see a little bit of that even in the Walter Lippmann colloquium before the war, where they're but where they're trying to do this. And it's also in his, uh, you know, program at the end of the war to try to have an interstate federalism and these other kinds of things. How do you reconstruct Europe, which is a major question. And as you know, you know, it was very important for him to have like Walter Eucken at the first MPS meeting so that you actually bring in the Germans again. And it's all part of, you know, getting beyond where we were in the war. And how do you develop that and, and, and whatnot? I think that the, the issue of... Uh, might be as follows, and I, I don't know how, you, if you agree with me on this, which is I think that in Hayek's world, uh, when you are designing institutions, you're designing institutions within side 
of a evolved system. You're not standing in the Archimedean point outside of the system. So Hayek practices economics from the inside out, as opposed to economics from the outside in. Um, at least this is what I would argue, which is that the priority, and, and, and just to give you an example, so you sort of see where I'm coming from, especially since you do a lot of macro, is that when Bob Lucas revolutionized macroeconomics, his thesis was basically that no actor in the economy didn't know what the theorist knows, right? So they're, they're able to then pierce through the fog and understand when inflation is happening or whatever. There's no fiscal illusion. There's no monetary illusion. To Hayek, it's that no economist, no theorist can ever know what the actors in the economy have. It's a different, it flips it. And so to Hayek, the priority is always on the cleverness and creativity of the individual agents that populate the world that we're studying. And so with inside of that, they can, in fact, just like Menger argued and just like Hayek, they can, in fact, improve upon the rules by tinkering on the margins in some sense, right? Whereas to a constructivist, they stand outside of the world and they try to create it anew. And I think this is like a big difference between the French Revolution versus the British Revolution or the American Revolution and, and all these other things. So I think that that matters um, about where it is that you are doing the kind of correction to the dysfunctions that exist or have been exposed in the liberal imperfections or whatever, and you try to fix it. Um, but, you know, this is the last thing I'll say about this is that if you take Hayek's evolution as a monetary theorist, as an exemplar of his evolution about everything else, you can see that a lot of his different adjustments throughout his career are from frustration of the failure of his first effort to try to get, let's say, a neutral money, right? I mean, he's so, so neutral money is a goal for him, not that money can ever be neutral itself, but the goal of policy should be that. And he starts out with, you know, various different ways to try to get that. And every time they fail. And so by the end of the 1970s, right, he's like, his, he's frustrated. And he's like, okay, so maybe government monopoly over the issuance of money can never work, right? And he gets rid of that. And I think you see that in several other of his positions as well, um, as that he matures out of frustration uh, of the inability to tie the ruler's hands. If I could effectively bound the rulers by the constitutional constraints, I could have the liberal order. But the problem is, is that the rulers are constantly breaking the bonds. This is the paradox of government that you were talking about, constantly breaking the bonds. And so one way to think about it is, is that was Hayek, you know, matures as a thinker, he puts a little bit more stress on not starving the state of resources, but figuring out ways that we might starve the state of responsibility. So that in fact, what might be a traditional argument for why we need government to do something, could we imagine an entrepreneurial solution to that um, and, 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 and whatnot? And I think that's, you know, again, it's an imperfect thing. It's, it's a combination of both a theoretical imagination, but also an empirical check. And you have to see, you know, and see whether or not you can scale and, uh, you know, because one case doesn't prove it. <laughs> Right. So, you know, you, you know, and, and, and whatnot. So it's, it's a, to me, I think it, it sets in motion a fascinating research program, but that's at the level of a intellectual program, not a practical policy program. Um, but let me check back up for a second. Then I'll, then I'll be quiet. One of my favorite books is by Richard Epstein and it's an IEA monograph and it's called free markets under siege. And one of the things that Epstein talks about in that monograph is that the there's so much low hanging fruit in public policy that would improve the lives of millions of people if we just did it say for example uh, Europe getting rid of agricultural subsidies so that African farmers can in fact ship their goods to Europe right it, it's a, it's a win-win all along as opposed to the French farmers fighting you know for the protections and I think if we think through all these like little, little things, like in Austria right there, I guarantee you there's regulations that are 
insane at some level from an economic point of view. And if you could just like get rid of them, so we don't have to ask the deep, deep, deep problems that you're raising <laughs> that are almost intractable, right, in some sense, because if we just fix the sort of easiest little policies, you know, price controls or quantity, you know, tariffs or whatever, we would end up by improving our lives so much better. And then as we get that, we would maybe get more and we get more and that kind of thing. So I like the Epstein approach to policy. <laughs> get the low hanging fruit first. What would you like to comment on that? Or would you have another question to Mr. Batki? Well, I have just one, one last uh, summary. I, I think it, it, was a, it would be a good summary to say to, to most present day problems, the, the first best solution would be to, to search for better institutional de to a better institutional design. And perhaps if you are questioned hard, uh, what you would advise a policymaker who, who faces a, a current problem, Uh, the simplest answer would be uh, do no harm. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, that. That that's the that is the first rule, right? Is that we should follow at least what the doctors are supposed to be following. You know, uh, I mean, you know this, uh, Hans Erd. There's um, I love this uh, book by my colleague Erwin Decker on the Viennese students of civilization, and his argument is is that. The early Austrians culturally were connected to this idea of this therapeutic, you know, perspective, right? Which is that patient will heal thyself kind of idea. And, and, and that metaphor drives a lot of the way that they think about things. And I, you know, I tend to think about the importance with Hayek is that he wants to see that the institutional framework has to be fixed at some level to be respectful of property and persons, to fit the sort of generality norm, uh, to be able to, but, it, it, but he also has to have social approbation and disapprobation in the right way. So that private property rights are respected in the society, not just codified in law, right? That they actually, so, because otherwise if we didn't respect private property rights, we'd need a policeman on every corner. And we, therefore we couldn't have It, the cost of, of, of enforcement would be prohibitive. And so we need to have this issue of the social approbation and disapprobation. It's kind of what was mentioned before about the social philosophy of our culture our, 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 uh, has to shift again to understand sort of these basic liberal principles and their importance for our social arrangements. And without that, we're going to have very difficult time being able to achieve any of our goals. Do you have any further questions or would you like to comment or correct? <laughs> no, <laughs> at all. So, thank you very much, Professor Klausinger. Um, so we now have time to, enga to engage to questions from the audience. If you should have a question, please just raise your hand and one of my colleagues will hand you a microphone. So we can be so first over there. Uh, sorry, you could make it, beat, but uh, my question really is, uh, times have changed. Remember that uh, The Road to Serfdom was a book of the month club selection and, but you may not be aware, was actually uh, abridged in Reader's Digest condensed books. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't imagine that uh, these days. Uh, have you any comments uh, on that? Sure. This is what I was talking about with respect to the tacit presuppositions of our age. So our task is, is Hayek, by the way, faced a monumental task. As, um, as Hans George and, and, and Bruce uh, lay out in their book, um, the tacit presuppositions were radically against Hayek as well. And so he faced a tremendous change. But because of Hayek, because of people like Milton Friedman, because of other scholars in the mid 20th century, by 1980, and, and along with events, uh, by 1980, those tacit presuppositions had flipped, okay? But unfortunately, um, in the 1990s, I would say uh, classical liberals across the world were more worried about politics than about culture. 
And as a result, politics is about minimum winning coalitions. Understand that, right? Politics is just about coalitional politics. That's how you have to understand it. You want to have a minimum winning coalition. And, and if you focus on that, you end up by losing the idea of what the liberal utopia is. Uh, and we see it at the cultural zeitgeist to the left. The left has dominated that space, including media and everything else. It's at, remember that when Hayek wrote The Road to Serfdom, there still were intellectuals like Max Eastman who had converted from their socialism to more or less a conservative position, and they wanted to promote those kind of ideas. Henry Hazlitt was the economics editor at the New York Times. He wasn't a minor figure, right? He was a major figure at the, at the New York Times. When Ludwig von Mises' book, Human Action, was published, it was reviewed in the New York Times, right? In, in, by John Kenneth Galbraith, uh, right? So can you imagine that same kind of thing going on today on in the New York Times on the Sunday book section that like say Paul Krugman would be the one reading, you know, Hayek by Caldwell and and and, and Clausinger, right? I mean, and, and and whatnot. So the culture has in fact definitely changed. We need to actually be aware of that and see what are the alternative cultural points that can push on that to put pressure. Um, at one point, the internet seemed to be one way in which you could have more open discourse, um, but that has turned into its own issues as well. Um, and so I think we have to be creative and clever intellectuals to figure out ways to communicate ideas in the best form that is capable for us to do for today's generation. In my last slide, the very first line in it is we have to meet students where they are today. So not where I hope that they would be, but where they are. And that's why it, it's so important for us to understand what they consider to be important questions to them, the climate, inequality, these kind of questions, you know, as opposed to say, you know, when I'm stressing the idea of fiscal, fiscal irresponsibility, there's a very good case that they might not care about that because they don't know about that. Whereas in, in my generation, that was like a big thing. Like, my social security isn't going to be there when I, you know, what's going on? Why is the government sort of screwing up my social security or whatever? They're not even thinking about that because they don't think they're going to be alive because the climate is going to destroy them in the next 15 years. And so this means that we have to address them where they are and address that. And so this is what we face a real challenge. You're hundred percent correct. Times have changed and we need to be very uh, conscious of how it is that we go about trying to, communicate the basic message that Hayek, for example, was trying to communicate in the road to serfdom for this generation. Thank you very much. Are there further questions in the audience? Yes, in the front row, please. Professor, thank you very much and hope you feel better. Um, two questions, sir. Um, first question, how would the Austrian school handle the problem of the environment and pollution if you left it to market forces uh, might not get a very positive outcome. And number two, you showed a slide of the long sweep of history and uh, capitalism. And, uh, and the, my question is, how do you explain China that's done so well eco economically? Because in your slide, you dealt with GDP uh, per capita, but in China, obviously there's four times the number of people than in America, and now they're the number two economy in the world and first by PPP. So I'm looking forward to your answers. Thanks very much. Okay, let me take your first one first about the environment. So I think that one of the first things that market-oriented people need to do is admit that there is a issue with the climate. So not to try to deny that there's a problem, uh, that climate change is real, climate change is man-made. The question is, is how do you address it? What's the most effective way against the trade-offs that we all face? And so I think there's an intellectual horse race between what we, call, we could call adaptations to climate change and mitigation policies to climate change. Um, there's a fantastic book that was published in 2019 by Matthew Kahn. 
At the time, he was department chairman at Johns Hopkins University. Now he's a professor, chaired professor at University of Southern California. Um, it's called Adapting to Climate Change. And what he does is he tries to run an intellectual horse race between adaptation policies and, um, and, and mitigation policies. And his argument is that adaptation policies are more effective at a lower cost than the mitigation policies. The second thing that I would argue is to is a Julian Simon point, that the ultimate resource is the human imagination. And so as we confront problems and they come to us, the more that we free up the entrepreneurial innovation of individuals, they'll figure out ways to be able to actually address the hairy problem of the climate in a way that lowers, remember the, 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 the market drive is to produce more with less. And so that drive is gonna also be involved in ways that we internalize externalities and all of the rest of the stuff. And so I would, you know, both this, this guiding by the price system, adaptation policies, and also innovation. And so I would put a high premium on economic growth. And the reason why we put a high premium on economic growth is that economic growth and development allows us to cope with the crisis of the climate in more advanced technologies. So the wealthier we are, the better off we are in trying to res wrestle with things. Why is it that we see where the climate has the biggest effect is in fact in places that are very poor that get affected by you know, uh, the, 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 the negative consequences. So that's, that's the economics. And again, it's an intellectual horse race. It's not a priori, all right? It's a, you can't answer uh, empirical questions philosophically. You have to answer empirical questions empirically. And so we have to actually you know, get our hands dirty and study that. On your second point, that relates again to China. China is a very, very interesting case. Um, so you have to make a bunch of distinctions in different time periods. So, you know, the original reforms between 78 and 85 that, that Deng Xiaoping did after the Cultural Revolution, they were not really market-oriented reforms. It's not till 1985 that you start getting the market-oriented reforms. But you have to remember is that they never had a market in the same way that you're talking about it. They had some special economic zones, um, but they also had a lot of white elephants. That is government-sponsored industrialization projects which is different from development. So there's a difference between development and industrialization. And what China has experienced under Z is industrialization, not necessarily economic development. So I actually don't believe the, the, the data uh, that puts them as this growing, vibrant economy, precisely because I think their economy is extremely vulnerable uh, to uh, you know, basically the existence of white elephants, uh, you know, putting, putting uh, you know, the thumb on the scale to favor some groups as an expense to others. And so what we're witnessing is similar to the kind of growth figures that were peddled around in the 1950s about Soviet economic growth. And one of the things that those were revealed in retrospect was they were wild overestimates because they valued, the, they measured the value of the inputs, not the measure of the value of the outputs in the economy. And I think this is a real problem in these kind of regimes, and uh, and and it and it has consequences for the way we measure things. So you know we'll we'll see if uh, if China can sustain itself as an economic system um, over time when exposed to the sort of global marketplace of ideas. And uh, we'll see. You know. Um, and, and by the way, whether or not it also, if it is moves in that direction, whether or not it succumbs to the kind of internal pressures that Friedman and Hayek identified, which is that as you free up the economy, you create a middle class, you end up by having a middle class, which then is going to put pressures to constrain the, power, the, uh, the arbitrary power of the government. And then eventually you get more and more political freedom. The fact that you have a hollowing out of a middle class is one of the reasons why you would have doubts about whether or not they've actually experiencing development as opposed to industrialization. And I think that's, you know, but China is going to be something that we're going to be studying, obviously, for a long 
time and, 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 and wrestling with. It's one of my struggles, okay? Remember I said there's a struggle as a scholar and there's a struggle as a citizen. Figuring out China and, and all that, I teach comparative economic systems. Figuring out what's going on in China is a major struggle, right? Just like some other things, like the rise of, of populism throughout the globe. That's like, you know, it's a mystery. Why, why all of a sudden did that happen and why was the timing for that? And, and, you know, these kind of questions are all sort of things that we have to really wrestle with as political economists. Uh, thank you, Professor Petke. Uh, I know you cannot see the audience, but I can see that there are many questions. So maybe uh, I would like to kindly ask you to give your answers a bit okay. more shorter so yes. we can have more questions. But thank you very much for elaborating on your struggles. Um, we would like to take the next question in the first row. As Professor Petke, as Stefan Beig, I'm a journalist. You uh, claim that um, the problems nowadays and can be solved by economics, and also economics um, uh, can over with, with economics we can overcome those challenges and this crisis. However, we did get there, and economics didn't prevent us from doing so. So, what went wrong? Do you think there was a there were some basic uh, mistakes in contemporary economics done? Economics got derailed. And it's a long detour. This goes back to my mainline uh, economics. So there's a, in the history of economics, there's mainline economics, which traces from Adam Smith all the way up to Hayek. And then there's also mainstream economics, which is just what's ever currently scientifically popular. And sometimes the mainline is the mainstream and other times it's not. And when it's not, that's when all these emphasis of various different schools of thought like property rights economics, law and economics, public choice economics, entrepreneurial economics comes in. And, and just to be very quick because of, of the interest in time, just so we're clear, mainline economics is derives, uh, it, it, what it does is it derives the invisible hand proposition from the rational choice postulate via the institutional analysis. If you deny that the rational choice postulate can generate the invisible hand, Keynes, you're not a mainline economist. If you collapse the invisible hand proposition to the rational choice postulate, you're not a mainline economist. Arguably, George Stigler. Okay? So, but who's a mainline economist is those that focus on the mechanisms that are put in, pa in motion because of the institutional environment in which we find ourselves. And so that's going to be the focus. And that was how economists was, economics was practiced from Adam Smith to John Stuart Mill. And that is how the early neoclassical economists practiced economics from the founding, fa the founding fathers of the Marginalist Revolution to Frank Knight. But what happened was after Frank Knight, economics got detoured. And it got mainly the main person for the detour is Paul Samuelson, but it got detoured by very brilliant people and for a 50 year period. And that, in fact, in many ways, still dominates the way we do economics. And it needs to be challenged and addressed to try to have the kind of economics as a solution that I was talking about. Sorry. Thank you. We have the next question right over here. Uh, thank you very much for your lecture, Professor Bretke. In your opinion, are there areas of the economy where government involvement is absolutely necessary? For example, uh, preventing or breaking up monopolies or the huge uh, 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 infrastructure programs which cannot be financed through uh, um, regular uh, uh, capitalist means. Um, and uh, if so, where would you draw the line where this government involvement should end or start? Okay, so <clears throat> I think Abraham Lincoln, uh, in an essay, I think it's called Government Fragments, um, laid out specifically what I think is the test. He says that government should do those things and only those things which private citizens cannot do well for themselves and government can do well for itself. Note the test. Citizens can't do it, and the government can do it. And that's the real serious question. 
because in order to do the cost benefit calculations of let's say an infrastructure project, we would have to look at see whether or not the government can in fact do that infrastructure project in a way that in fact isn't worse than if the market did it even imperfectly um, because of rent seeking and, and various other things that are, are involved. So in the US, for example, we have major highway projects in Boston, look it up. There's a thing called the big dig which they were trying to, you know, refix the highways around Boston. And it ended up by being a 20 year project rather than a five year project. Okay. Because of the way in which the unions and everyone, you know, lobbied it. Similarly on monopoly, Milton Friedman famously said he would rather have a natural monopoly than a government regulated monopoly. Why? Why would he actually say that? right? Where would that come from? It's because the government regulated monopoly would involve the interest groups that are involved and stave off any kind of entrepreneurial innovation that could erode that monopoly power of that, of that because you're giving it a government established monopoly. And so I would, I would look and see, you know, can government actually achieve the goals that it's setting out for itself? And I would submit that government to, in fact, critical examination. Uh, in terms of you know, what I think government can do, the machinery of government, I think it, it, it's, uh, uh, you know, we need to explore. I have a book, by the way, on this. It's called uh, Public Governance in the Classical Liberal Perspective. It's published by Oxford in 2019. And um, uh, you know, it's, it sort of you know, goes through all that. I think there's a reason why we need federalism because we need competition in government services. But the basic enforcement definition, clarity, and enforcement of property rights would be where I would start uh, with that. Thank you very much. There's another question in the very back. Thank you, Professor Bertke. Um, I'd like to share a couple of thoughts and maybe a question on the issue. I think you're absolutely right to say to state that the um, liberalism or market economy has a, um, an, an issue with marketing and communication. And uh, I think I'd, I'd share three ideas with that. One is the what you could call the error of Cicero. Uh, number two would be public choice crime stories. Uh, and number three would be the issue of personalism. Uh, as for the error of, of Cicero, that, that has been called like that in the uh, history of uh, philosophy, um, that rational explanations only go so far with human beings. Um, that is, we should probably not try to only um, uh, convey the ideas of market economy with rational ideas and abstract arguments, um, because as you, of course, will know, and most most uh, everyone in the room, um, Hayek called it the innate or the acquired atavism of people. So socialism will always be a deep uh, inbred uh, psycholo psychological trait of the human uh, person. And I think we have to be honest that, that this is the case and find ways um, how to address this deep innate psychological trait of the human person and not commit the error of, of Cicero and only trying to be at the rational level. That is number one. Number two is the issue of personalism. Um, I know an institute in um, uh, Switzerland, in Zurich, they try to explain to the Swiss people the idea of, of market economy um, via the best entrepreneurs, via the biographies of, of, of specific people who had in specific times found specific solutions to specific problems. Um, of course, in this case, um, uh, Swiss, um, Swiss entrepreneurs. Um, and so they try to explain in very specific biogra biographical terms um, what it actually means to have um, um, a vivid, uh, entrepreneurial uh, community and society. So personalism as a solution. And the third just come up my mind when I did study political economy. Actually, my favorite topic was public choice theory. And I always thought it would be a good idea to have an author, a author, a writer to actually take the public choice textbooks and the case studies and convert them in, into good um, crime stories, e uh, economical crime stories, just to, to show to the, to the audience cri crime stories are always... Um, uh, like with the public, to show them how it works when government interferes and when government um, colludes with, with big business to the detriment of, of the free uh, market and to the detriment of most people. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it's a very good point. Um, I think as an economist, um, I, 
so Jonathan Haidt, the, the psycho social psychologist, years ago tried to make this argument. He said libertarians, uh, you know, focus too much on the, you know, basically right brain kind of thing and not enough on the left brain. And so a bunch of libertarians got in their head that what we need to do is make, you know, the arguments, um, uh, you know, much more palatable to the people by telling stories and things like that. And I, I agree with that. I think that that's a good thing to do. Um, but I also think that part of what we want to communicate to people is the necessity to think hard about these issues, right? We don't want to give up the, the truth and the light of economics, right? Just because people are, in fact, emotive about things. I'm going to, here's a, I apologize because I'm going to be, I try not to be long-winded, but I, I probably will be. But uh, there's a fantastic book by a guy named Bernard Yak. And it's called The Longing for Total Revolution. And it's an examination of the thought of, Mar of Rousseau, Marx, and Nietzsche. And what he argues um, is, is a Cambridge University Press book, I think, or Yale University, anyway, um, and uh, um, called The Longing for Total Revolution, YAC, uh, Y-A-C-K. Um, and um, what he argues is that they are, are uh, non-enlightenment thinkers. So when we try to counter them with facts and evidence, it doesn't have any effect because what their system is, is an aesthetic. They're painting a picture that you find either attractive or unattractive. All right. So they paint the picture of capitalism that has nothing to do, for example, by Marx with actually reality, but it's a picture that you despise. And he paints that aesthetic. And then he paints a promise of the future socialist world, which you in fact, you know, buy into or whatever. And so how do you counter that? Well, to me, I think one way to encounter that is to embrace enlightenment values, science and the possibility of progress through science, all right? To embrace the enlightenment, not to run away from the enlightenment. And I think at this day and age, given the philosophical trends that have gone on, we need a re-defense of the importance of the enlightenment for, human, for the human condition. Um, so I, I want to fight the, the battle on the reason, though I understand maybe it's the Cicero uh, thing. Uh, I, on the other point about personalism, I think we should focus on problem solvers in the world. This is what uh, a group in the United States now called Stand Together is focused on. They're looking not at the theorists, but actual people that are solving problems in communities and highlighting them and helping them support that. Um, I was very influenced by a man named Richard Cornell, who wrote a book called Reclaiming America, Demagging America, and Healing America. Those are his three main books. Um, he was a, a sort of a father figure to me and a mentor. Um, and one of the things that Dick always used to say is, we don't need think tanks, we need do tanks. <laughs> people that actually solve you know, problems in communities, set up schools or, you know, figure out ways to sort of have a former, you know, convicts be able to integrate into the economy to give them a future of the world or whatever, future life. Um, so I think that's right. Personal problem solvers and they should be highlighted. The final thing is on storytelling and public choice. I do think there's some great examples. One of them is Yes Minister. So if you look at the TV series Yes Minister, it's a very public choicey kind of story. On the other hand, uh, this is what I was asking about before. In the United States, we had this um, TV show called House of Cards. And that really wasn't a public choice story because that's conspiracy. I think there's a difference between the machination of politics and conspiracies uh, that go on. Uh, there might be an overlap, but, but anyway. But I agree. I think that your examples of engaging in more storytelling, of, of communicating to younger people and stressing these different things is a very important message. I, as an economist, just don't have a comparative advantage in appealing to people's emotions. And I want to appeal instead to their reason and, and those facilities. So I'm fighting a, uh, an up, uh, uphill battle. The, the last thing I'll say about that is Hayek talks about that atavism. It's a very important point. So you're, you're spot on. But he also says that that atavism is a product of our immature minds. 
So one way is to actually try to address people that have the immature minds. The other way is to try to turn immature minds into mature minds. And I think that's what economics does. Thank you very much. Further questions from the audience? Hello, Warren, in the front row, was that raising your hand? No. <laughs> yes, over there. Uh, in the third last row, please. Thank you. Hello, Professor. Thank you very much. A uh, quick question, no, quick, uh, general question, more on a philosophical side. And uh, Professor Klausinger may comment as well, if he wishes. Um, you touched on that with the last, with your last answer, but I'm very interested in knowing um, how do we get, how do we get rid of these bad ideas? Mises and many people after him disproved socialism, communism, Marxism, all those bad theories. They were logically disproven, factually, but they keep coming back. They're a weed that just keep coming back. And I'm, I heard a theory or an argument, a logic, uh, several times already that socialism and all these mm, basic theories, Marxism, etc., are not actually economic theories. They are more like mm, ideological or maybe even religious cult ideas. And that's why we can't get rid of them because they are not logical. They are emotional, religious, whatever you want to call that. And that's why we can't get rid of it. So I would like to hear your thoughts on that premise and how you would, how we can combat that or counteract those bad ideas so we can <laughs> maybe someday really get rid of them. Thank you. <laughs> um, I mean, it, this is a, a, a major challenge. Um, it's obviously one of the things that that uh, you know, Hans George is dealing with in the biography of Hayek's own efforts to try to address this issue. Uh, you know, my my teacher Jim Buchanan. You know, at the end of his his uh, coming to the end of his career, he wrote a paper called "The Soul of Classical Liberalism," in which what he argued was that we needed a kind of moral reawakening to appreciate like what the class. So you can't just win it on the efficiency arguments. You need to have a kind of a moral reawakening. So what he called the soul of classical liberalism um, and, and to get that across. So I think we're engaged in a effort at what's called political economy and social philosophy. And we have to be willing to jump into those conversations with both feet and prepare ourselves for those kind of conversations. So that's all we have. All we have is the ability to engage in discourse with our fellow citizens and try to persuade them through the power of ideas, you know, that, that this is a better way to arrange human affairs. And we can marshal evidence, logic and evidence as best that we can. And we need to be really good communicators. So, you know, one of the reasons why Milton Friedman was as talented as he was, he was an amazing communicator. Right. He, he always smiled. He wasn't angry. He knew how to you know, interact with people. Um, he was right for the time that he wrote. We need to find communicators like that today. And, you know, that's that's the only way that you're going to end up by having that. When when I was a kid. Milton Friedman would be on the afternoon talk shows like Phil Donahue. Right. These are, you know, like they would be like Oprah Winfrey today. And that was Milton Friedman. Now, you know, Hayek couldn't be on that show, right? I mean, you know, if you ever watch an interview with Hayek, uh, you know, he, 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 he spoke, you know, in paragraphs rather than in sentences, right? And uh, whereas Friedman, you know, sharp, right to the point. So we need people like that. So not like me. <laughs> I read too much Hayek. <laughs> Thank you. Um, is there any further question from the audience? Yes, here on the back. So thank you very much for your insights. 
um, as an ecologist, identify the human population growth and the human population size to be a big challenge uh, for the human uh, for humans in future and also for for nature on this planet um, mainly since mainly because um, the land that we need to feed this human population is limited and the most that can be um, where you can grow food there is already food growing and the little uh, nature that is left also has um, important um, ecosystem functions that serve us directly. Um, and history has taught us that a slowing of human population growth happens mostly when um, a country reaches a certain amount of wealth. And how do you think this could be achieved in those areas of the world that are growing the fastest? And they're also uh, the poorest. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, we're not going to be able to resolve this today, you and I, because uh, we're, we're polar opposites on that. So recently uh, in, in Science Magazine, Naomi Arekis uh, wrote an article, said 8 billion people is not an accomplishment. It's a crisis. So that's more or less on the lines that you're talking about. I'm, I'm a Julian Simon person. So I think that the ultimate resource is the human imagination. So the more people that we have, the more likely we'll have another Mozart, another Einstein, another that are the problem solvers that will come up with the solutions to all of these issues like that. And I think that if we, if we look at that um, and unleash that entrepreneurial spirit, so I would look at Julian Simon's book called The Ultimate Resource. If you send me an email at the university, I just wrote a paper called the, the uh, economic logic of the ultimate resource, which goes through the economic arguments for why Simon had the arguments that he had. Um, and so, you know, yeah, I can't say much more today precisely because it's just too big of a, con of a, of a, of a, of a divide between us in terms of the way that we see the vital role that population growth plays in either delivering us into a hellscape or delivering us into freedom. And so, you know, that, that would be, yeah, it's just, it's just a very big debate. Thank you very much. Um, Professor Batsky mentioned that you could send him an email and that's actually what we are going to do later. We're going to provide you with his university email address. And he also kindly provided us with, with a PDF uh, of his last book, The Struggle for a Better World. So you will hear from us and also have the chance to pose any further question you might have directly to Professor Bötke by sending him an email. At this point of time, I believe there are no further questions. So I would like to kindly thank Professor Bötke for your lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you. I greatly appreciate the opportunity. Hopefully we see you next time here in Vienna. You're always welcome to come and visit yes. us. Um, yes. We would also like to thank Professor Hansjörg Klausinger for the discussion. <laughs> and we're looking forward to the second volume of your book. Thank you. <laughs> um, many thanks also to the Federation of Austrian Industry who provided us with this wonderful venue and also for the IT um, support. This was very great. Thank you so much for having us here today. <clears throat> Last but not least, thank you to all of you for your interest in the uh, Austrian School of Economics and for posing such interesting and challenging questions. You might wonder what comes next, both here and at the Austrian Institute. Well, if you want to be updated about the Austrian Institute, please just subscribe to our newsletter. It's a monthly newsletter and there's all information you might want to know. I just want to highlight one thing, which is the Austrian Academy. It will take uh, place for the fifth time this year in September. 
And as Professor Ronheimer already mentioned before, uh, it's oriented towards people uh, aged 30 and below. So if you are aged 30 and below, I'm looking forward to receiving your application. Otherwise, please just uh, recommend the Austrian Academy to any uh, young interested persons you may know. Um, fine. Oh, yes. Here we can see the book <laughs> of Bruce Kalbert and Hansja Klausinger. Um, it's the first of two. And yeah, thank you. Lastly, we invite all of you to the buffet outside. And the team of the Austrian Institute and me, we are looking forward to seeing you there. Have a wonderful evening. <laughs>